If you have a Bible with you, you might want to turn to the fourth chapter of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 4. In this summer, we're looking at various Old Testament stories and seeing how they might speak to us in our day. The last couple of weeks, we actually talked about stories, well, the same story. We talked about it for two weeks in 2 Kings chapter 5, so we've backed up just one chapter. The prophet who is in the land at this time is named Elisha. He was trained by Elijah, a prophet, who, a prophet who had been taken to God in a fiery chariot, an amazing story in that, that we probably will get to before the summer is done. In this particular case, beginning in chapter 4, verse 8, it says, One day Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. We'll just stop and look at a couple of things as we start the story. First of all, she's a well-to-do woman or a wealthy woman. I read from the NIV, that's the ESV. So she's a wealthy woman. The Bible has never, by the way, condemned wealth. Never in any place did it condemn wealth. It did, and in several places, God would point out that what people would do to get wealth would be condemned. People who are greedy and selfish, people who, when they finally get their wealth, use it just for themselves. God has had a lot of negative things to say about that. And then that well-known phrase in the New Testament that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But God never condemned people being wealthy. As a matter of fact, God made people wealthy, such as Abraham in the Old Testament. God made him very rich for his day and time. And wealthy people who have been blessed by God, who are not operating out of greed or selfishness, tend to be extremely generous with what they have. I have seen people do unbelievable things with the wealth that God has blessed them with. I recall many years ago, a fellow by the name of Jack Exum. Anybody happen to remember hearing Jack Exum? Uh, Jack is going to be with Jesus now. But Jack came to our church. In those days, back in, back in the 80s, Jack was going around the country doing a thing called Three Unusual Days, where he would speak on Friday and Saturday and Sunday. And basically on Sunday, he talked about giving. And inevitably, every time he left... Every church's contribution went up because of the way he explained giving. It was a, an amazing gift he had. And I remember he preached that sermon on giving, and two things happened afterwards. One is a lady walked up, and back, that was back when you had to wear a coat and tie to go to church. Anybody remember that? And so there was in a coat and tie. By the way, I think I still have that coat and could never get in it again. It's somehow shrunk. But this coat I had on, she, she walked up and she slipped something into my pocket and she said, give that to Brother Jack later. And, and I reached in my pocket after church and it was a hundred dollar bill she just wanted to give him. And I thought, I I'm your preacher. <laughs> Another is that a guy walked up to me and said, you know what Jack's talking about is absolutely right. He said, every time I give away a hundred thousand dollars, I find myself looking to see where it's coming back from multiplied. He said, I feel guilty before God because I keep thinking that's going to come back much more than I gave. And I walked away thinking, I'm your preacher. $100,000. And back then in the early 1980s, it'd be equivalent to what? Six, seven billion dollars now. So it was a lot of money, a lot of money. And he was a wealthy man who gave away tons of money in his lifetime. And many people do. Many of us have been the beneficiaries of people who have been wealthy and generous. Now, this wealthy woman, she sees this guy, and she urged him to come eat some food. In other words, come by the house for some dinner, and he did. And look what it says. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. You know what that teaches us? You feed the preacher, he's coming back. That's what it says right there. Now, look back at that first verse, just uh, that verse 8 one more time. I realize I'm saying a little longer than I should. I just want to clarify that last thing. If you, if you feed the preacher good food, he's coming back. Uh, you may not remember, but there was a time when, when uh, all ministers were invited after Sunday to go to somebody's home to eat. Anybody remember those days at all? And it was always fried chicken. They called it, they actually called it the gospel bird. Because so many ministers ate it. And there were homes I went to that I thought I would come back here anytime I could. And there were homes I went to that I thought, oh, Lord, deliver me. So we look at the next verse, and here's what it says. And she said to her husband, behold, now I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. Now, she knew he was coming by all the time. She knew that he didn't have a whole lot of money. This particular prophet, and you can read about the next chapter, actually on one occasion turned down over $11 million in our currency that somebody wanted to give him for what he had blessed them with, and he wouldn't take a penny of it. This particular prophet lived basically a pretty simple lifestyle. 
And so he wasn't staying in all the inns, as you would imagine. At least we assumed that he wasn't. And she said, what am I going to do is to make a prophet's room. She also understood the value, by the way, of giving him his own place to stay. Now, there are people who are very generous and kind who will invite you to stay at their homes. And then while you're staying there, you absolutely get no rest or peace or comfort at all because they really want all of your time. She knew better than that. One quick, quick story. Many years ago, Alice and I were to go speak. I was actually doing the speaking. It was the Church of Christ. We went down to a church down way down south. And it was in South Alabama, as I recall. And, and I said, well, you know, thank you, but we have decided we no longer stay in people's homes. It was because we never got any resting in people's homes. That was back when that's where they put you up. They said, oh, no, this lady has cottages right on the bay. And you actually get one of the cottages to stay in. And that was awesome. That's not where she put us. She put us upstairs in her house. There was no door, and she was popping up every day at all hours, any time, to talk about nothing. I'll never forget the time I had just stepped out of the shower. I had walked into the room and was drying off, and she popped through that door. I went under the bed. You can ask Alice later. I'm not exaggerating. Under the bed because I was naked and ashamed. And so I went under the bed, and you would think she would go, oh, I came at a bad time. She sat down and conversed with me. She's in the chair. I'm under the bed. I could see her feet. How you doing? Good to see you. Now, this woman, ask Alice, that story is absolutely true. This woman thought he needs his own prophecy, so she made a prophet's room. They actually built it. Now, understand they could build it on their roof because those roofs were flat, and so she actually built a room up there for him. Many years ago, I filled in for a church in Texas for a whole summer. I flew out every Saturday for a summer. I flew back every Sunday afternoon just filling in for them between preachers. And it was a wealthy family who had built what they called a prophet's room right behind their house. And, and I was able to stay there. It was like an extremely nice apartment. And they had built it just to bless people who were people of God who were passing through their community. It's a pretty neat thing to have. So they built him the room. The next verse. One day he came there and he turned into the chamber and rested there. In other words, he went to his room. He's there resting. And he says to Gehazi, his servant, by the way, Gehazi is not a really good guy. If Elisha knows this already, he's made no indication of it. But it's certainly going to come up later that Gehazi is not a good guy at all. But he is the servant of the prophet. So he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. She lived in Shunam. Therefore, she was a Shunammite. All right. When he had called her, she stood before him. And he said to him, notice this, he calls the woman up to see him, but he addresses himself to Gehazi, the servant. He does not talk directly to the woman. He tells Gehazi what to say. Gehazi talks to her. You say, well, was that part of the culture of the day? Might have been, except in all the rest of the story, he talks to her directly. So I don't know exactly why he does this, except that this is a common thing for Elisha to do. You'll see in the next chapter, the story we talked about last week and the week before, that a very famous man came to see him, and he wouldn't even come outside to talk to him. He sent the servant out to do all the talking. It seems like Elisha somehow didn't feel totally comfortable around people. Oh, that's just my opinion. But it seems like they did that. either that or he was just sometimes a jerk, a guy who just avoided people not because he was uncomfortable but because he didn't necessarily like them. You say, a man of God who doesn't like people? One of my dearest friends on the planet who does an amazing number of things to help people, loves people and doesn't like them. As a matter of fact, he'll often tell them, I don't like you. But he loves people and goes out of his way to do things for them. He just doesn't feel comfortable being with them. He doesn't like being with people. Maybe that's true. I don't know. But he says to his servant, say now to her, see, you have taken all this trouble for us. What is to be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? What he's saying is, can I talk to somebody for you? Can I use my influence? Can I get you some kind of a favor somewhere, somehow? And here's what she says. I dwell among my own people. Here's one thing you're going to discover about this lady. She never complains. She, she's never going to complain about anything, even as you'll see in the story, when she has every right in the world to complain, she just doesn't do it. Whatever you say to her, her answer always basically is, everything's okay. Everything's all right. And we're going to come back to that in a couple of minutes. But basically when she says, I dwell among my own people, that's just a way of saying, I've got what I need. I'm fine. I don't need anything from you. So the next verse, 
And he said, what then is to be done for her? Now, apparently this next conversation, starting in this verse, didn't happen while she was still standing there. Uh, she's left, some kind of time has passed. So he's now talking to Gehazi, his servant. He says, okay, she didn't want anything. She says she's got everything she needs. What can we do for her? Gehazi answered, well, she has no son, and her husband is old. Hmm. He said, call her. That's how we know she wasn't there. He calls her back. And when, she had, and when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. She'd just come there to where he lives, that little room that she's made for him. She's standing in the doorway, and he said, at this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. Well, let's just stop there for a minute. One of the reasons that we say that there's indications to us that the Bible is inspired, what that means is that it's not a human document, that, that it would come from some divine being. One of, the, one of the points we usually make when we talk about the inspiration of Scripture is its brevity. What that means is that things that many times humans would go on to explain, God doesn't. He just gives the facts. If you're old enough to remember Jack Webb, Dragnet, just the facts. And so you look at this and go, wait a minute, how can he tell her this? Where does he have this kind of ability? Did God make it so that anything this prophet promised God would do? Did God give him that kind of a carte blanche? Or, or is it possible that in, in the meantime, and it's just not said here because the Bible is so brief, is it possible in the meantime that he talked to God? That he said, I really want to do something for this woman. And, and she says she doesn't need anything, but I've discovered that she doesn't have a child, and, <clears throat> and I know that she really wants one, so God can, I promise her a child. All that's left out. We don't know whether God just gave him the ability to make promises and God fulfilled them, or if he had talked to God, or even if God had somehow already just spoken to him. Maybe not in an audible voice, but in some other way that God just told him something. Now, just a little experiment here. How many folks here, and we'll go by a show of hands, believe that at some point in your life that a message came into your brain, maybe not an audible voice, but it's just something that you, quote, heard, end quote, that you believe with all of your might came from God, that God somehow spoke to you? Anybody have an experience like that? <clears throat> now, quite a few people have their hands up. <clears throat> I have had those experiences as well. We don't always know whether it really is God or whether it's something we really feel strongly about and it's our own emotions or our own intellect telling us. But I believe that there are times when God gives people messages. You know, we used to have a hymn song way back. I don't know if we've sung it here or not in a long time, Terry, called Beyond the Sacred Page, I Seek Thee, Lord. Never heard of that song? I would sing it, but nobody would recognize it if I sing it. All of my, all of my songs have the same melody no matter what they are. Beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. Anybody remember that old hymn? There were some churches that would not sing it because they said, no, 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 no. God never speaks to us beyond the sacred page. God only speaks to us through the sacred page, and so they wouldn't allow people in the churches to sing that song. I'm quite convinced that there are times when God sometimes just tells us what to do. That you don't know, you can't prove that it was God, but it sure feels like it was. And then when you do it, a marvelous thing results that you couldn't have made happen on your own. I think when that happens, you can only go, wow, what a coincidence. Or you can go, thank you, God, I'm glad you told me to do that or to say that, to be there or whatever it might be. Now, when he says that, at this season, about this time next year, you'll see Lebrace's son. And she said, no, no, my Lord, oh man of God, do not lie to your servant. Now we can infer a whole lot from that about this lady. She definitely has been wanting a son. The likelihood of her having a child has been decreasing. Obviously she's not very old yet, but her husband is because it points out his age, but doesn't point out her age. Her husband was getting older, therefore having less ability to produce a child. And when the prophet says to her, this is going to happen, her first response is, don't tell me that. You're just going to break my heart. Because what's going to happen is you're going to get my hopes up, and then nothing's going to happen, and my hopes are going to be dashed. Now, surely, 
most everybody in here has at some time gotten your hopes up about something that just didn't happen, right? And did it hurt? Yes. But what if, what if somebody that you really believed was of God said, God's going to do this for you. Here's a promise. God's going to fulfill it. Now, over the years, I've actually run into people who have made statements like that, who've looked at me and said, God said to tell you he's going to do this for you. And when I was much younger, I would often get my hopes up thinking, amazing, thank you, God. And then those things never occurred, which told me that it was not God who was speaking to them. On the other hand, I think God can. I've told this story before. I'll just make it very brief. Many years ago, a friend of mine named Jeff King was on a cruise with us. Jeff, as a matter of fact, is going to be here in a couple of Sundays. When Jeff was with us on this cruise, it was a cruise that Alice and I used to put on for single people. Uh, the first one, I think we took 140 single Christians on a cruise. And it was also they can meet each other and have a good time just with other Christian people. And, and on the first, before the, we ever left the dock, we had a little reception where everybody came in to meet each other. And this one young woman walked up to me and she said, I should have never come. I have endometriosis. It's causing me tremendous pain. Uh, they said I have to have surgery. And I don't know why I'm here because I'm going to wind up being in my room the whole time because I hurt so badly. Jeff and I walked out onto the deck with her, took her out, sat in some deck chairs, and we prayed intently, God, please heal her of this. When we finished our prayer, I felt to the core of my being that God had just healed her. Now, how can you look at somebody and tell them that without creating false hope? Do you understand? And I was so convinced that I had heard that message. It was so assured inside of me that I literally said to her, God has cured your endometriosis. It's never going to come back. The whole cruise, she had no pain. On the last day of the cruise, she came up to Jeff and me and said, I'm afraid for the cruise to end because I know the kind of pain I have. And when I go home, it's all going to come back. And I said, I'm still convinced. I really believe that God indicated that you are healed. I ran into her a few years later, speaking somewhere. She walked up, remember me, told her story. Oh, yes, I do. Whatever happened with that? She said, never, never came back. Thank you, God. Oh, so Joe, then, then we should come to you for healing. I, I wouldn't think so. That's a pretty rare occasion. And besides, I don't choose who God heals. I've never been given carte blanche by God. God chooses who he heals. But on that particular occasion, I do believe with all my heart that that message came from God. And when I gave it to her, it was from God and it turned out to be true. But can you imagine the pain that so many people who love God and who follow him have created for others because they were so convinced God told them something and they passed that message on and then it never occurred. Can you see the pain that would have been caused here? I'm just giving a little word of caution. If somebody tells you that God says something, make sure that it's really from God. Or if you're convinced that God told you something, unless you know it to the core of your being, be very cautious because our own emotions can take over. But he promised her a child. Look at the next verse. The woman conceived. And she bore a son about that time the following spring as Elisha had said to her, Thank you, God. We got a baby. Wonderful. Look at the next verse. When the child had grown, now we don't know exactly how old the child is, but he can travel on his own. He can go out to where his father is in the field. So not only can he walk and talk, he has some degree of maturity. He's still a child. He's not grown up yet, but he's grown enough that he can actually go work with his dad in the field. When the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. So they're out there reaping in the field. Next verse. And he said to his father, oh, my head my head the father said to his servant carry him to his mother now something's wrong maybe he's having a heat stroke maybe maybe he's having an aneurysm in his brain maybe maybe something else we don't know what it was but it's pretty serious and the man did what men always do take him to his mama she will know what to do she'll know how to take care of him even with our grandchildren we have two grandsons if I'm with them, just the three of us, or just one of them, just the two of us, and they get hurt or something happens, they say, go get Nana. I'm here. I know. Go get Nana. So look at the next verse. And when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother, 
the child sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. It's always painful to lose somebody we love to death. Yet sometimes the pain can be mitigated because of the fact that we, under, we see it as following the natural course. Uh, an aged parent dies, or somebody who has been sick for a long time. There's actually a group called Compassionate Friends that exists just for parents who have lost their children. They're a very special support group for each other to parents who have lost their children. Many years ago, I was invited to speak to one of their chapter groups in Montgomery, Alabama, and I, I'll never forget that, by the way, they don't let them use euphemisms like passed on or asleep in Jesus. They make them say the hard words like died. But in that particular meeting, the majority of them said was killed. The majority of them by drunk drivers. It's just really painful. It's more painful than any of us who have not lost children can really comprehend. But imagine the child being in your arms. I mean, he left the home that morning. He was healthy. Everything was wonderful. There's no expectation. They bring him back, and he's ill, and, and the mother had nothing she could do for him. There was no emergency room to take him to back in those days. There were no medical doctors with amazing equipment. All she could do was hold him. And we can assume that she prayed. And in her arms, he dies. This child that she'd waited on for so many years, this child that apparently was her only child now, the child that she loved beyond measure, as we all do with our children. And he's dead. The next verse. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Now from the subsequent verses, here's what you understand. She didn't tell anybody. She didn't tell anybody the boy was dead. She took that lifeless form in her arms, craving that he live, and take that, she took that body up those stairs, up to that roof, through that door, the very same door where she had stood in the doorway and been promised years before you're going to have a child, passes right over that same threshold where she'd received that amazing news and now places this child on that bed. And she shuts the door. Nobody's going to know. Not yet. Look at the next verse. Then she called her husband and said, send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. Next verse. And he said, why? By the way, this is how we know that he doesn't know the boy's dead. He said, why? Why? why will you go to him today? It's neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. In other words, it's not a day of worship. Why do you want to go see the preacher? What's up? Look at her answer. All is well. Everything's okay. It's what she said back when Elisha first asked her if she needed anything. I've got all I need. And now, is something wrong? Everything's okay. Is she, is she denying reality? Is she being totally foolish? I think, as subsequent verses will indicate, I think it's an amazing level of faith. Look at the next verse. Then she saddled the donkey and she said to her servant, urge the animal on. Let's go. Let's get there as fast as we can. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. She's thinking, because I'm a woman, you're going to think we need to go slow. No. You go as fast as you possibly can. If I can't take it, I'll let you know. The next verse. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, look, there's the Shunammite. Next verse. Run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? And she answered, everything's okay. All is well. Look what happens next. And when she came to the mountain, to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. Now, that's an act of begging, pleading, pouring her heart out. 
but she called over his feet and, her, and she's not going to let go. Remember, there are cases where this guy tends to talk to other people rather than to you, like you tell her this. She's going to make him talk to her. She's not going to let him get away with it this time. She caught hold of his feet and the Gehazi came to push her away. How dare you touch the prophet? This is uncalled for. This is unseemly. You can't do this. But the man of God said, leave her alone. For she is in bitter distress. You can see the pain on this woman's face. You can see the agony that's cloaking her. Yet when she talks, she says, everything's okay. But you see that her heart is broken. And the Lord has hidden it from me. That is not told me, indicating that God did tell uh, Elisha things most of the time. As a matter of fact, there are several stories that follow these where he just had an amazing knowledge of what was going on because God told him. But God didn't tell him this time. It appears... <laughs> It appears that God wanted him to actually have to interact with this woman. Not from a distance, but up close and personal. So what did she say? Did I ask you for a son? Is that pain? Is that bitter distress? Did I ask you for a boy? Didn't I say, don't deceive me? You know what she's saying? I think I would have hurt less to have never born a child. To have had him such a short period of time. And then he's taken suddenly away from me. She's heard it. By the way, that's the closest thing to whining she does. It's the closest thing to complaining she does. She just says, why didn't you leave me alone? Next verse, he said to Gehazi, tie up your garment, by the way, because of the way the garments were back then, he could run faster if he pulled up that robe and tied it. Tie up your garment, take my staff, and go. If you meet anyone, don't greet him. If anyone greets you, don't reply. In other words, you don't let anything slow you down at all. You get there as fast as you can and lay my staff on the face of the child. Now, this is not an unusual behavior for Elisha. He often sends people to do these things. He often does things from a distance. Look at the next verse. Then the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives, what that means is, as surely as there is a God, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. She doesn't trust Asa. Maybe it's because she's picked up on his personality and his flaws. I don't know. Or maybe it's just because of the fact it's like, you're the man of God. I'm not leaving you. I'm not going anywhere. I'm with you. How many of you mothers will be that persistent? Most of you? Yeah. There's an old adage. Never get between a bear and its cub. Never get between a mother and her child. If you want to get hurt, that's the place you will get hurt. You do not get the hand between the mother and her child. So he arose and followed her. Apparently he wasn't going, but she insisted. Gehazi went on the head and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. Therefore he returned. He ran back to meet the prophet on the way and said, the child's still dead. The next verse. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed, his meaning Elisha's bed. The next verse. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. He's in there by himself with this dead kid. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. This has led some people who don't believe in miracles to say, oh, mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. No, this boy's dead. He's already cold. This is a miracle. Why is it a miracle where he has to do this? Hmm, let's keep going. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him. In other words, he did it. 
You remember the story in the New Testament where a woman came up behind Jesus. He didn't even know who it was because the crowd was pressing against him and she touched the hem of his garment and she was healed. You remember that story? And Jesus stopped and said, I felt the power go out of me. Who touched me? That's where he first started. Who touched me? The apostle said, who touched you? You're surrounded by people who are touching you. What do you mean who touched you? He said, I felt, I felt the power go out. It drained him. Apparently, it's draining this prophet. God is draining him. He's draining him emotionally. He's draining him spiritually. He's draining him in all kinds of ways. He's on top of this boy, and the boy's beginning to respond, but it's wearing this prophet out. He's having to give it his all. God's making this guy work for this. God could have healed him like that if he wished, but God's making this occur. So the fin finally, the prophet gets up. He's exhausted. He, he walks just a little bit to get himself get his equilibrium back and then he goes back and lies on the child and does it all over again completely pouring himself into this healing and then the child sneezed seven times seven by the way is a number in the bible that means perfection he sneezed or completeness he sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes then he summoned Gehazi and said call this Shunammite so he called her and when she came to him he said Pick up your boy. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. We're going to skip the next. An amazing miracle, don't you think? I think there's several stories here, or at least several points for us to understand and remember. The amazing faith of this woman. You might be thinking, did God give her a son because of what she did for the prophet? I think the answer to that is decidedly yes and decidedly no. So wait a minute, you sound like you're running for office. How can it be both yes and no? Yes, God saw her heart and God wanted to bless her. No, she didn't earn a son by building a room. You see the difference in those two things? When God sees your heart, God will give you blessings, but you don't buy God. You don't make him do things for you by saying, look what I did, now you owe me. God doesn't work like that, never has, never will. But the heart of this woman was good. You think she was perfect? I've never met one yet, have you? Not a perfect woman on the planet, nor a perfect man. Mazella was looking at me like, finish that, finish that thought. Not a perfect one on the planet. So she wasn't perfect. So yes, it was because of what she had done. And no, it wasn't because of what she had done. What she had done showed her heart, and God blessed her, but she didn't earn a boy by building a room. But look at the faith this lady has. What do you need? I've got everything I need. When we know that in her heart she was craving a child. Then when the boy says, Sick, everything all right? It's okay. The boy's dead, everything okay? Yes, all is well. What did she mean? I struggle. There are many times when I look around and, and, and rather than, than seeing Jesus in the boat so I can walk on the water, I see the wind and the waves like Peter did and I begin to sink. Anybody else ever like that? I can see all the things that are wrong, all the things that are bad, all the reasons it's not going to work, all the reasons it's going to fail completely. I'm really good at telling you why something's not going to happen. Why? Because so many times in my life I have seen it fail. I think sometimes that's a difference in the faith of a child and the faith of an adult. The child can have such pure faith because they haven't seen the failures. But those of us who have seen the failures tend to look around and go, oh. We've tried that before. We've prayed that prayer before. We've asked for that before. We've done this. Let me tell you how that went bad, and that went bad, and that went bad, and that went bad. Yet, it's the faith of a child that Jesus wants us to have. But rather than looking at the wind and the waves and the times that's failed before, this woman could have said, I married an old guy. We're not going to have any babies. We have tried and tried and tried. It's not going to happen. It's well. Your boy's dead. It's well. Does that mean you don't care? I care with all my heart. 
But if this is the will of God, all is well. There's the point. If this is the will of God, all is well. What if God didn't raise the boy? Boy be in heaven. All is well. Would she hurt? She's hurting like crazy. You saw it. But my pain doesn't mean that God is not being served. My pain doesn't mean that God's not doing it the way he wishes. And if God is doing what he wishes, all is well. Do you think that that level of faith might have led to the resurrection of her son? The answer is decidedly yes and decidedly no. God saw that faith. God chose to bless it. But you can't look at God and say, see how much faith I have? You got to do what I want. You still can't buy God, even with faith. God is still God. God makes his decisions. So, anybody facing something right now where everything within you screams, no, it's not okay. No, it's not all well. I mean, you need to hear how things are going. It's bad right now. Anybody feel like that at all? So what do we do? I trust you. All is well. I need to keep saying that. Why? Because it'll affect how I think. It will affect how I feel. It will affect my faith. And if we truly believe that God is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, then we must believe that from his perspective, all is well. We must trust that he knows what he is doing. So thank you, God, that all is well. We've come to a time of helping. We're going to stand in just a second and sing this song. If you would like somebody to pray with you about your faith, about something that's really hurting you right now, where you just want somebody to help you by praying with you, God, make it all is well inside of me. Then we'll have people here to do that. John will be up front. I'll ask a couple of our shepherds to be standing in the back. You just go and look at him, and, and, and your spouses go with you, gentlemen, if they're with you, so they can walk up and say, I just need you to pray with me that in my heart all will be well, because God does bless us. If we can help you, let your need be known when we stand and sing. We place you on the highest place.